Hello, my name is Kathy Sullivan. I am the director of the Kent County Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. We are a coalition working together to pre prevent youth substance use and promote wellness across the lifespan. Thank you so much for being here. I'd like to thank the Department of Health COVID grant for supporting this presentation and the Department of BHDDH for the support for our work as a coalition. I'd also like to thank Andy Nada, who's here this evening. He is the East Greenwich Town Council, the town manager actually, and thank him for your support, Andy, for prevention and for the youth. You're always such a great supporter of this work. So we really appreciate that. As you know, um, every age group has been affected by the coronavirus pandemic. People have lost their jobs, lost loved ones, struggled to maintain some sense of normalcy while life feels anything but normal. This experience has had a serious impact on our collective mental health. So much so that the demand for mental health treatment has skyrocketed over the past few months. Tonight though is an opportunity for us to hear how the pandemic has specifically impacted teens. This is our chance as adults to listen and learn. It's important for us as parents, educators, and community leaders to understand how they are being impacted by the pandemic and why we need to talk to them about their mental health during this time. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Bob Hodling. He's the East Greenwich Drug Prevention Counselor who's done amazing work in that community for over 30 years. He will introduce our panel of amazing teens. And um, after the presentation, after the youth have gone through their work, we ask that you use the chat box if you have questions and we can, and feel free to do that, um, to ask the teens any questions that you have. Um, but for now, I'm gonna hand it over to Bob Hodling. Kathy, thank you so much. And I wanna thank you everyone for being at, to watching us and being with us this evening. Uh, my name is Bob Hodling. I am the director of the East Greenwich Drug Program. And I often tell people that I have the best job on the planet Earth because a significant portion of that is I get to work with young people. And for all the challenges and all of the things that people say about young people, uh, that they're not doing this and they're not doing that, I get a chance to see young people who really care about their community, people who have stepped up during the COVID crisis and met the challenge. A few years back, I was able to uh, get together with a group of young people who were very interested in the field of mental health. And this particular group of kids helped create an organization at East Greenwich High School called ASAP. Later on, I'll ask them to discuss what ASAP is, what the acronym is. But for the most part, what I'd like to do before, without further ado, is to give the young people an opportunity to introduce themselves and give us like a one minute overview of who you are and why you joined ASAP. And I'll begin with Michaela. Hi, my name is Michaela Shunny. I'm a junior at East Greenwich High School and I'm one of the co-founders of ASAP along with Ella. I'm also um, involved with the ASAP Team of Teens Club, which is kind of like a subsect of ASAP. Um, I do the Sunny and Shunny show with, uh, with Sunny, usually once a week on the East Greenwich Academy Foundation Facebook page. Um, and I, I got involved with ASAP essentially because Bob almost forced me to when I first met him my freshman year. Um, he kind of came to me and Ella with this idea of a mental health group and we really took it and ran with it. And I'm just so proud of what we've done so far. And it's really just something in my life that I'm so happy to be doing. And it's helped me a lot with my mental health too, personally. Guys, I just hope you would forget the word forced as opposed to encouraged. So we'll move on. To, we're gonna go to, to Sophie. Hi, I'm Sophie Brusini. I am also a junior at East Greenwich High School. And I had a number of friends who were in ASAP when it started. So it was only a matter of time before I was dragged in. But in all seriousness, I got involved in ASAP because ASAP has such an impact on the community. And I could tell that they were doing really powerful work. And I wanted to be an individual who could be a part of that and who could be a part of the change that they were bringing. Thank you. Miguel. Hi, my name is Miguel Figueroa. I'm a senior at East Greenwich High School, and I have, you know, helped out with running ASAP. I've, I've done panels like these. I've helped write articles about mental health for our club. And I first got involved with ASAP because I have a lot of respect for these sorts of local community activists. And so I think that if anything uh, the past couple of years in activism have taught us is that change tends to come from uh, the bottom up. So I figured what better way to 
affect change, especially in the community that I do care about, than to be a, a local activist with of the Bob Hodling variety to help people on an interpersonal level, maybe even affect some some policy change, but mainly give students a space to help them deal with the very hyper specific problems that come with living in East Greenwich um, and maybe branch out to other communities to allow students to figure out the hyper specific problems in their communities as well. And you might hear my cat uh, in the background there. Okay. That's, I apologize for that. No, we, I think there's a few of you who have cats out there. Sonny. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sonny. I am a recent graduate of East Greenwich High School who's taking a gap year before attending college. And I was never really a part of ASAP during high school. I, I do have to admit that. And, but, but what happened was uh, near the end of my high school career, I was sort of approached by Mr. Bob who had been a club advisor for a club that was running called HSDRI. And we sort of kind of banded together to do something nice for you know, the senior class by hosting this kind of pizza night or pizza giveaway where Mr. Bob was incredibly generous and essentially paid for about 60 pizzas that we gave away to members of the senior class. And so from that point on, I, I sort of got to know Mr. Bob a lot better. And with reasons similar to what Miguel said, I, I really admired how he built so much empathy and community within East Greenwich. You know, it, it, it was extraordinary to me how many people he knew you know, so many people come up to Mr. Bob on the street and they're like, hey, Mr. Bob, how, how's it going? And I feel like he knows everyone. And he builds incredible relationships, something that I, I a skill that I really want to learn as well. So I sort of got more involved with ASAP uh, through some, we did some discussions on race and social justice over the summer. We also came up with this diversity proposal that we presented to the town council. And yeah, I as I'm taking my gap year, I've sort of stayed connected with ASAP through the Sunny and Shunny show, uh, as well as just conversations with Mr. Bob, who always checks in to catch up. And I'm sure people are going to want to know a little bit more about the Sunny and Shunny show as, as we go down the line. Ella. Hi, my name is Ella Saint. I'm a junior at East Greenwich High School, and I am a co-founder of ASAP alongside Michaela. Um, and technically, I got into ASAP because Mr. Bob approached me in the hallway and said, um, I'm gathering a group of kids because I had this idea for something I think is really incredible and I'd like you to be a part of it. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't know what ASAP was. I completely blind. I just said yes. And that's that was one of the best decisions I've made in my entire life because um, I am non-neurotypical, I'm neurodivergent, I've suffered with mental illness my entire life. It has been a, a staple of my existence, essentially, and I've struggled tremendously with it. I've watched friends and family members struggle tremendously with it, and all I've wanted, ever wanted, really, was just to, to make everything that I've gone through and everything my family's gone through mean something. And I think the best way to do that is by taking our suffering, taking our experiences and using it to, to make things better for those who come after us and make things better for other kids who are like me and give them the tools that they need to get themselves out of what could be a very dark place. Thank you. Now, before we get into some of the nuts and bolts, it's essential that I point out that ASAP is constantly evolving. And even though I've been credited for some of the formulation, it's the kids who have taken the ball, modified it, and made it applicable to the school population. The original intent of ASAP was one thing, but this is now branched off into community service wings, uh, school adjustment wings with team of teens. The kids are constantly challenging me to make safe places in school, constantly challenging me to bring up other topics. So let's keep, we have to keep in mind that what's wonderful about ASAP is we have a core philosophy and some, you know, it's a support group where in, our intent is to educate people, but we're also looking to empower people and destigmatize mental health issues and concerns. But the kids, it's essential that I recognize is we can come up with the framework and the parameters. They're the ones who are driving the bus. And I wanted to see if we could begin. Michaela, could you tell us a bit? Wait, ASAP is an acronym. Could you tell us a little bit about what ASAP is? 
Yes. So um, ASAP is an acronym. It stands for Assess, Support, Action, Proceed, and Prevent. Uh, and essentially, one big thing that ASAP does, especially when we were first starting out, is we educate. We, we, when we first started out before COVID, freshman, sophomore year, we would go into some of the elementary school classes and talk a little bit about what ASAP was, mental health with like some younger kids too, because one thing we noticed getting to our age is that we never actually got educated on mental health. We all just kind of had to deal with it. So we, one big thing about starting ASAP was we wanted to destigmatize mental health. And a great way to do that is to talk to kids who are younger. So starting out in the acronym, one way we like to explain it is kind of using, using an example. And um, I always use a math test only because that's like a subject I struggle with. And that's something that brings me like a lot of anxiety is studying for tests. So we start out with assessing the problem. So my issue would be, I have a math test coming up. I'm really, really anxious about it. And it's tomorrow and I have to study. What am I going to do? I'm going to assess the problem. What do I have to study? All those types of things. Then I go, sorry. Then I go on to support. So one thing I can do to prep for that math test is go to my math teacher who would be a support for me. Or if I'm feeling really stressed, maybe I could talk about it with a friend or some member of my family. A support is a really big thing, especially when dealing with mental health issues, only because you wanna have somebody there for you. And I think that's something that ASAP puts a lot of like stress on and emphasis on of how important that is. The next thing is take action. So I would actually start studying. I would make a plan to study. I would just take action and, and do it. Essentially, I would start studying, reduce my stress by, cause, uh, by fixing what is causing the stress, and then proceed. I would go on the next day, get a good night's sleep, and I would proceed. I would take that math test the next day. And then the last step, which I personally think is the most important, is prevent. So say I, this math test gave me a lot of stress. How am I going to prevent this in the future? I would maybe next time I have a math test, study a couple days before. I think that's one thing that um, ASAP, it's just, we really like to stress this acronym because we know that not a lot of kids are gonna like have this sheet, sit down in their room and go through every single step. That's not what it's meant for. It's just kind of meant as like an outline to start teaching people about mental health and give them something that they can look at to be like, hey, I'm feeling stressed right now, I might need some help. Um, another thing that ASAP does just in general of what ASAP is, besides educating others, we also do educate ourselves. We like to do, um, we do trainings with people. We did a training at Faith Hill Farm, which was, I, I'm sure Ella will definitely say, was one of the best experiences. So we not only, we know that we're not just like, preaching. We, we want to educate ourselves. We want to better ourselves so we can talk to other people and educate them as well. Um, I think that's very important. And we also, I don't want to go too much into this because I think Sophie will explain. We do a lot of other things in our community, especially at our school. We run two other clubs, a community service club um, and a club connecting underclassmen and upperclassmen, which is just a really big part about ASAP, especially in COVID, because it's tough to go into and educate younger classes when we're not even in person doing school. Uh, so that's really tough. I think COVID uh, has changed ASAP, but almost for the better. And I think we're going to take a lot out of this. And we've also had to uh, adjust the way we've educated and adjust the way we've run the club due to COVID. And I think that's going to be a big topic tonight. Michaela, thank you so much. And now we're going to have Sophie. Sophie's going to give us a list or, or describe some of the activities that we've done in the community and in the schools and maybe some of the other thing and branched out to other areas that Michaela just alluded to in terms of social justice and trying to influence climate. So Sophie. So ASAP has been very, very busy over the past few years. And as Michaela spoke about, we do have a few outreach clubs. Um, one of those clubs is a wing of ASAP called ASAP Outreach. And we try to do a lot of work in connecting members of the community and um, just doing general community work, try to support everyone. One of the other initiatives that we've been working on has actually been led by another member of ASAP, Emmy Nutting. And we're working on adding more LGBTQ plus information to the current health curriculum in our freshman year. The focus of that is going to be on educating students on the different labels and just in general opening people up to new experiences because that's how we can grow and reduce stigmatization. 
along the same lines, um, Michaela has also been working on heading up a new element of the health curriculum, which is adding more awareness of the dangers of eating disorders, specifically in sophomore year, and perhaps removing other material that may encourage eating disorders. And we're just hoping to protect students and, again, increase awareness of some of those dangers. Similarly, we're adding mental health information to the upperclassmen cur health curriculum. And we're just, again, trying to educate students on the dangers of mental illnesses, provide people with support that they might need, provide people with resources that they could reach out to when they're feeling stressed or in, their, in a crisis, because that's one of the main focuses of ASAP. I have also been working on leading a podcast with Bob called Lucy's Booth, where every week we bring on a guest to discuss issues anywhere from mental health problems to social justice problems to even the pandemic because it's had such an impact and we need to start opening up and having conversations about that and including education reform too. Similarly, Michaela had mentioned that we're she's working on a podcast with Sunny called The Sunny and Shunny Show where they interview members of the community and just generally spread awareness about some of the projects that members of the community are working on and bringing us all together. Another way that we've been brought together is with walks that we sponsored that are led by Bob Hodling. We actually did one just a few days ago about Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We generally try to bring closer the members of the community and it's really great because those walks often tend to start very thoughtful conversations and they raise awareness and they celebrate the impact of holidays that we don't generally recognize and maybe sometimes we need to. Michaela had also mentioned Team of Teens, which is um, a very good club that she started with Sydney, another member, and they connect upperclassmen with lowerclassmen and they help generally transition students from the middle schools to the high school because especially in a pandemic it's very confusing for students to do that because they've never been to the high school they don't know what to expect they don't know what new stresses they might expect and so having that mentor there and having that support is going to be very beneficial. <laughs> Michaela has also been working on starting up monthly support meetings among peers at our school so that students can go and just talk about their mental health issues in a space that's not judgmental and it helps people realize that their problems are not individualized and they're not the only ones struggling. I've also been working on a similar project where we're creating a email based hotline so we can connect people with specialists and support in their area. We can help people find resources and just generally converse, help people figuring out what they're struggling with. And you can find that at ASAP, spelled A-S-A-P-P, hotline.weebly.com. One of our other projects has been weekly mental health reminders led by Michaela, because especially in a pandemic when things are very crazy, we often forget to take care of ourselves. And that's why it's been very important where people can sign up for a text chain and they'll get weekly reminders about just ways to take care of themselves, way to manage their mental health, you know, because we forget to do that. And I've fallen subject to it. I'm sure a lot of you have. It's very important and we need to make sure that we're doing that. Another way that we're trying to get people to take care of their mental health is by creating a break room at our high school, East Greenwich High School. When people are pushing through the day and they're pushing through a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety, it can often lead to really severe burnout, which is, has, it's been an incredible problem among students. So we're trying to create a space where students can go to take a breath in the middle of an overwhelming day. Another fun little project we've been working on, also led by another member, Emmy, we're writing, we're, we've written handwritten notes to all of the teachers at the high school because we recognize that teaching in a pandemic can be really stressful and really taxing when you're constantly being exposed to you know, a virus, a deadly virus. So we've reached out to those teachers and we've sent them handwritten notes along with ASAP masks to let them know that we really appreciate all of the work they're doing for the community and we see their efforts. 
Sophie, thank you very, very much. And now one of the things that I would like to do is I want to ask the young people to share a little bit about what's the student uh, climate like in there in terms of what are you seeing or feeling as some of the major stress and stressors, either you're feeling yourself or you're hearing from your peers? And what are some ways that ASAP has helped to ameliorate them? I guess in terms of personal stressors for me, I, re I was really competitive both with myself and with others. And so I, I found that to be, you know, something that really energized me and, and pushed me to achieve a lot more than maybe I wouldn't have without competition present. But I also found it to be something that's incredibly stressful if you focus too much on it, right? So for me, a big stressor until I learned to find a balance with it was this idea of competitiveness and, you know, how I can also use it as both a fuel, but also avoid it in terms of the negative effects that it can have on my mental health and my body as well. So one thing was definitely competitiveness. And I guess another stressor that I think I had was, you know, not necessarily feeling like everything I did was purposeful in some regards, because when I looked at some of my actions and I, I like to reflect on my actions a lot, I, I didn't necessarily see that purpose or like a unifying purpose between all of them. And so for me, that, that, that was something that bothered me because in a way I was kind of already having these existential questions about whether or not what I, what I was doing had purpose, whether or not I would make an impact on this world. And it, it was kind of, you know, hard to accept that at an early age, potentially, I wasn't necessarily making the impact that I wanted. So for some time before I learned to balance that as well, I, I definitely struggled with this idea that I, I wasn't accomplishing the things that I wanted to, that I wasn't making as much of a difference as I should. So I'd say competitiveness and I guess this existential dread almost uh, definitely were some things that were unique stressors for me at least. Now I know Sonny, and, and one of the things that you decided to do before I jumped to everybody, you decided to make a very, very uh, difficult decision you decided, uh, you know, you got accepted, you were accepted to a very, very good school. You did very well at East Greenwich High School, but you decided to take a, take a gap year. What was the motivation behind that? Well, I, I definitely think there were several, you know, in, in this unique year, I would say, I would call it unique, you know, to be optimistic. I'd say that virtual learning wasn't something that I was a big fan of. You know, I think teachers, they do a great job. I think the students, they're all working really hard. But for me, the eye fatigue, uh, the constant sitting behind a screen, you know, the lack of social interaction, it was, it was, it's not something that I find optimal. So I realized, and I, or I not necessarily realized, but I definitely thought about this, about how my time could be best spent. And so when I looked at that, I, I saw that having 168 hours in a week for the next 52 weeks, that's a lot of time that I can devote to improving myself, to pursuing opportunities that I never had the chance to do in high school, like founding my own tutoring company with some friends who are also taking gap years or pursuing an internship for nearly full time. That sort of thing is something I've, I'm always interested in. And you know, I, I finally had the time to pursue it at an age that might be earlier compared to my peers, but it's something that I feel ready for. And so, having the chance to do those opportunities and also just having time to reflect on what I want my goals for college to be, what I want the goals for the rest of my life to be, even just thinking about that now, you know, having this time to reflect and I guess chart out a little bit, plan a little bit more than I, I had time to do so in high school, then I think that's something I find really advantageous. So I decided to make the decision to take a gap year. Sonny, thank you. Uh, Michaela, what are some of the stressors that maybe you're feeling yourself or you're hearing, you're hearing from your peers and how has ASAP helped, again, lessen some of them? So what are you feeling and what are you seeing? So I think it's kind of funny how I probably could have answered this exact same question before COVID and talked for like hours about things I was feeling stressed about. And now just adding COVID on top of that, it, it's really tough because I think uh, we actually, we did send out a survey when we were doing the ASAP signups, I think last year about what students are feeling stressed about. Um, and I think it's really funny how 
uh, just with COVID, I actually went into school for the first couple of weeks. I'm not going into school anymore, but just being in that environment, um, I think a lot of students are, are actually stressed about the virus itself. I know a lot of students didn't feel safe going back. And now we are, we, we did a, uh, a like two week break, I think from school, and now we're allowed to go back and uh, I'm not going back. My classes for the people who are in person, there's just, there's really not that many kids. And I think that's one big stressor is the like actual virus of it all. But I think another stressor for students and just another thing that, that students are really struggling with their mental health being at home all the time. I mean, it's it's really kind of a tough thing to deal with uh, now that, I mean, COVID kind of has been happening since March and it's January now. It's kind of weird to look back and think about how I've essentially almost been completely home for like an entire year. And it's kind of funny because I like to say it's like Groundhog Day, like the movie where it's kind of like some days you just feel like you're repeating everything over and over again, which is definitely a tough feeling. Like for me, I need to do different things just to get myself through the day because sometimes I, I, I feel like an overwhelming feeling. Oh, I'm just going to take a nap. I'm just going to get in bed. It's not. And I think um, with doing online school too, like, schoolwork is just 10 times harder to do. It's just everything with COVID has been amplified. Um, so like stress, uh, anxiety, depression, all that stuff for me has just been completely, am completely amplified. So at least like in, in terms of personal, it's been kind of tough just in, this is only with COVID, just like getting through my day of like doing normal things. Um, but I think in terms of like my peers, you can definitely see that with everyone, even if they're not talking about it. I mean, a lot of people have also lost friends, which has been a big thing me and my, some of my close friends have been talking about is like, you're just not talking to that many people on a day-to-day -day basis. And for people who are social, like, like me, I'm definitely an extrovert. It's really tough not seeing a lot of people on a day-to-day -day basis and not talking to a lot of people. And I think just things like that really, really affect people's mental health. And I think things like what we're doing with ASAP, like the Sunny and Shiny show, we do that in person with masks six feet apart. And it's been really nice because at least personally, that's one thing I can look forward to during the week. I'm getting out of the house. I get to talk with a lot of different people from the community. And I feel like that's something that's that's good. We're kind of bringing the community together in a time where it's it's really hard to do that. Same with the different walks we've been doing, like the MLK walk on Monday. I wasn't able to attend, but I've been to a couple walks before that. And those have just been really great for the community because like social distancing, wearing masks is a great way to be able to see a certain number of people and still get that kind of like daily thing that we're doing. Um, so I, I think that's essentially what I've been like really stressed out about. And I think a lot of other students can say, say the same that like specifically COVID has just been a massive stressor throughout this year. You know, and I, um, before, we, I don't know if you're going to change the subject, but, but uh, before we move on, I did want to expand a little bit on the survey that she mentioned. And I, I have the op-ed up here. We as, a, as an organization wrote this op-ed for EG News, um, where we polled a number of students using social media and got a lot of quotes and information about what the students felt about going back to school. We did this back in September and the article was actually posted on September 10th, which was uh, four days before we went back to school. And uh, I can read a short excerpt from that article, if that's all right with everybody. Sure. Uh, so of the minority of students who were taking classes online, almost all of them were pessimistic. One student feared that they wouldn't be able to, quote, get the support they need by doing online, end quote. However, they did view online school as a necessity for them due to the presence of an immunosuppressed guardian in the house. Another student told us that they have a chronic illness and are therefore at much higher risk of death from COVID-19. Because of this, they will be staying home and learning online. Uh, both of these reasons are very common among students planning on schooling from home. Uh, many of the students that we polled faced are facing the realities of invisible disabilities like immune system deficiencies and chronic illnesses daily, and they're forced into a uniquely unforgiving corner of the decisions to continue schooling during the pandemic. They don't have the luxury of risking exposure to COVID-19 to possibly improve their grades, maintain that normalcy, or maintain their mental health. Uh, but that was about 20% of the people that we polled. More than 80% of those polled said that they would be attending school either full-time or with the school's hybrid plan. 
again, this was back in September before we saw a significant drop in students attending school in person. Of these students, most of them believed that in-person schooling was the only option they had to preserve their grades. Uh, in the words of one student, quote, I feel that if I don't go in person, my grades will suffer, end quote. Another wrote, quote, I wish I didn't need to do in-person schooling, but I fear that online school is difficult with hard classes, end quote. Students are aware of the dangers of COVID-19, but they prioritize grades and keeping on top of schoolwork above mitigating the risk of exposure. And though they do have the freedom to make those choices with their education, uh, as students should, the choices that they offer are limited and neither is truly satisfactory. So it was a really uniquely, it was kind of an honor to be able to culminate that information and those those quotes, those sentiments from students and to put them into a public community forum like that because we were hearing a lot of talk from the uh, sort of, from the adults about this, this sort of change of going back to school. And although their perspectives are obviously important, educators' perspectives are super important and legislators' perspectives are important, students' perspectives are just as important. So again, I think it was really cool that ASAP was able to put that information out there and hopefully, in, you, you know, change some minds about this whole situation, inspire people to make small changes in their own personal lives to accommodate for the sentiments of students. Um, obviously, our, we can't solve everything with an op-ed and our, we have plenty of our work cut out for us, but it was very nice to be able to do that. Sorry, just one point I wanted to make. Um, Miguel, you brought up students dealing with invisible disabilities and um, immuno immunocompromised um, parents and guardians. But I suffer from an invisible disability, that I met, as I mentioned at the beginning of the panel. And um, I've had to spend quite a lot of time in doctor's offices and hospitals during the pandemic, which has caused me to lose school time and uh, significant amounts of stress in, in terms of catching the virus. So um, Miguel, I thank you for pointing that out because I think that is very important to understand that students have different um, things going on in their lives that impede their, their ability to participate in school-based activities, including homework. Yeah, uh, I may be sad about losing my senior prom, but it's really nothing compared to some of the stuff other people are going through. It, okay. It's good to give people different perspectives uh, with ASAP. You know, if we can, because this, we're go, we've got some huge issues, but I think it is imperative. And one of the things that's great about ASAP is A, they do surveys. B, they are a pulse to the feelings and the uh, opinions of young people. If we can, Sophie, what are, you, what are you experiencing? What are you hearing from your peers? And how has ASAP helped you maintain connection with peers or develop resiliency? Well, I am a distance learning student, so I do all of my school from home and online. And it's presented me with some very unique challenges that I have never experienced to this extent before. One of those challenges is when you're on Google Meets and you're on Zoom calls and you're doing online school every single day in the same spot, you can get so burned out so quickly especially with those Zoom calls and being online, there's this feeling of an invisible audience. You feel eyes are on you at all times and it can exhaust you so quickly. In, at least when you're in school, sometimes you can be in the back of the room in the corner and you know that people aren't looking at you, but on Zoom calls, you have to be on all the time and you always have to have that social energy. And I am an introvert and I have very little social energy as it is. So doing that in the same spot at the same time, all day, every day is so exhausting. And I've experienced this weird exhaustion every day after school where I am out for at least an hour and I can do nothing but sit down and look at a wall because I feel so burned out. 
and students aren't acknowledging burnout because everyone experiences different symptoms and we don't we can't really pin down a definition for burnout but we need to recognize that this is a really really big issue especially with distance learning with all of that being said asap has actually helped a fair amount with that because one of the reasons people feel burned out is when the work that they're putting in is greater than the reward that they're getting. And ASAP has helped provide me with a feeling of reward because I genuinely enjoy everything that I do for ASAP because I feel like we're doing really good work that helps benefit other people. And just being in the space of ASAP and being connected to all of these wonderful human beings, it's working wonders, but that's still just a solution for me and we need solutions for everyone. Thank you. Now, Miguel, we, even before we went on today, we were involved in Philosophy Club, and you're involved in a bunch of things in addition to ASAP. And uh, you had just detailed some tremendous stress and stressors for young people. What are some things that you do or maybe ASAP can do that can alleviate some of those stressors? What are some of the things that you're connected to that addresses those many causal factors that you just discussed? So a couple of the things that we, we need to, we need to go into this understanding that there has sort of been a cultural failure um, when it comes to the uh, COVID-19 response. There's a lot of blaming oneself that's going on. Uh, and it's, the, the burnout that we we're experiencing, like Sophie mentioned, we, we have, students have trouble identifying it as burnout from these external factors. So in order to deal with that, you kind of have to start at the source. You need to recontextualize everything. What I sometimes find myself doing is realizing the extent of the tragedy. And it may sound like an overwhelming thing to do, but it's good to remember like, Th this burnout that I'm feeling isn't necessarily my own fault. And there are a lot of ways that we can help one another to do that. Uh, one of the things I have personally done and that Michaela has done is gone to our personal friend groups and been uh, support networks for one another. The fundamental like idea, like the philosophy of ASAP is uh, community and interpersonal based activism being a support network for one another. So part, I mean, that survey was both really useful to gather the information about the student perspective of going to school during a pandemic, but every single one of those respondents suddenly found themselves with a forum where they could express their views and express their own experiences instead of, instead of keeping it cooped up inside them. That, especially because it's on a community level, is super helpful super useful and it's a really good start to dealing with this, uh, again, on a student level. I've noticed that a lot of my teachers, a lot of other faculty in the school and a lot of adults that I come into contact with every day are dealing with these, uh, are dealing with the stress. A lot of them are going through the same self blame that students have to go through. And unfortunately, not, of them, a, lot, not a lot of them are talking about it. It's a really isolating thing. That's one of the problems with uh, this personal responsibility doctrine is that you end up feeling isolated when you're not having a great time. So hopefully as time goes on and as the sort of culture around this changes and as we make change to the culture surrounding COVID-19 and this tragedy, we can extend that sort of hand, that sort of uh, support network to the adults in our community and in other communities as well. Thank you. Sonny, now listen, if, if I'm rushy, because I also want to leave some time, because I know that there might be some people that want to ask you questions. So I want to go, you know, Sonny, what are you doing? Uh, you know, what are you hearing from your friends and what are you doing to maintain resiliency and how has ASAP helped you maintain some resiliency? It's a great question, Mr. Bob. Um, so about what I've been doing to maintain resiliency, I, I like to get out of the house, you know? I, I like to go for walks. I like to do karate with my friends. Uh, you know, I, I have like a different, 
I, I, have, I just have different interests that I like to pursue outside of the house. And that's, that's been good in terms of, you know, giving me a little bit more energy than I might normally have. I, I try to change up where I work. You know, I might sit on the couch sometimes. I might sit at my desk. I might sit on my bed, you know, just change it up a little bit just so that you have some variety to where you're working and, you know, you can get, you can, it feels a little different and a change of pace is always good during a, essentially Groundhog Day, right? This is Groundhog Day of all, like all over again, right? So there's that. And as for what ASAP has really done for me in terms of helping me build resiliency, it's, it's provided me with a platform. You know, I've, I had the sunny, I've had the sunny and sunny show going with Michaela for some time now. And it's been great having conversations with members of our community, getting to both hear their perspectives, talk to people I've never talked to before, you know, learning more about their stories because every, every person's story is unique, at least in some way. And so I've always strived to learn more about those stories, you know, become a community historian almost. And I think that the Sunny and Shunny show does a great job in doing that in documenting those stories. Um, also with the training at Faith Hill Horse Farm, and I, I guess there was also another event that we hosted there and getting to speak in front of the community. That's great because, you know, you don't really get those opportunities when you're an adult. I, I, well, I, maybe you do, but I, I, at least in my brief adulthood stint thus far, I haven't really had the same kind of public, op public speaking opportunities that I did when I was a kid, actually, you know, or when I was like in high school. So, you know, speaking from that perspective, I, I'm really happy that ASAP has given me the chance to develop new skills, you know, speak in front of communities. And that's helped, that's done wonders for me in terms of resiliency, because I get to practice a lot of different things that I might not normally do in a day on the job. Thank you. you no, know, Ella, this was the perfect segue for you. People have been alluding to the horse farm. And before we went on, you said that, you know, A, I forced you into doing something and B, the horse farm kidnapped you. I didn't know if you'd be willing to share with people um, what the horse farm is, what the training was that we did there, and how has the horse farm enhanced resiliency and what's that done for you? I'd, I'd love to talk about Faith Hill. I could talk about Faith Hill all the time. Um, when I say Faith Hill Horse Farm kidnapped me, um, when ASAP went to the training at Faith Hill for Horse Farm, which I will explain. Um, the owner, Pam, approached me and I spoke to her quite a bit because I do have a history in working at, um, at farms and horseback riding. And she asked if I would like a job at Faith Hill. And I said yes, because that's that it's actually my first job. And I mean, it's a dream first job. I'm not in a McDonald's. I'm not at a Wendy's. I, I get to be outside working with these in, incredible, incredible animals and really awesome people. Um, and I've learned a lot from Faith Hill. And one of the most interesting things I've learned is that emotion is far more complex than meets the eye. And of course, that's obvious in humans, but in animals too, it's, it's quite, quite complex. And as I've spent more time working at Faith Hill, I've gotten to know the, the 33 animals there, and the six donkeys and the single pig. <laughs> Um, and they all have very distinctive personalities. They all have different responses to stresses and, and to different stimuli. And they respond diff in different ways based on their personality. And Faith Hill does amazing work with analyzing equine behavior in comparison to human behavior and essentially using horses as a thermostat for human emotion. So one of the amazing things that Pam does is she works with um, St. Mary's and has children come in for equine therapy. They get to work with our horses and our donkeys for about an hour. And essentially, we just allow them to play together, to interact with one another. And Pam, the owner, takes notes on how both parties behave and how they respond to one another. And it's, it's an incredible meter for, for emotion. And I've, I've seen that myself because I keep alluding to the fact that I, I, am, um, I am neurodivergent and sometimes I have bad days. And I do have a horse at Faith Hill. His name is Phil. He's incredibly sweet. He's a rescue animal. Um, and he's an incredible thermometer for, for my emotions and for my bad days. Sometimes I'll be having a rough time and I don't even know, but, but he does. And his behavior will change. Um, and I think whoa, where did that shift come from? Why is he so stressed all of a sudden? Wait a minute, it's because I'm stressed. 
So that's actually what ASAP did when we went in for a training. We did the same thing that the St. Mary's kids do. Um, we were put into the arena with the six donkeys um, at Faith Hill and our two miniature horses. And we, we essentially just played with them the whole time. We built structures that were symbolic of, of how we felt about different things. And we just interacted with the animals and uh, tried to draw conclusions from how the animals behaved around us. And it's, it's really quite an incredible place that does fascinating work. So I, I highly encourage you to, to look into Faith Hill Farm. It's an amazing place. Um, but I would like to jump the track a bit off of the, the horse topic and just bring up something. While, while Faith Hill has been an amazing resource for me during the pandemic, there's one thing that I'd like to bring up that I've seen present in a lot of my friends, a lot of my peers, a lot of my classmates. Um, and it's also the reason that I've been yawning this entire panel, and it is not out of boredom. It's because of something called um, intentional sleep deprivation or intentional sleep procrastination, which is actually a trauma response to feeling as if you have little to no control over your life. And I know many of us feel as if we are not in control. We, we have little to no say about our day-to-day -day routine. Um, my, my peers keep bringing up the idea of a groundhog day effect. It's just the same thing over and over and over and over again. You have a little concept of time and a little control over your own life. And one of the natural responses to that, especially for a teenager who is already physiologically prone to an awkward sleep schedule, is to purposefully restrict the amount of time that you sleep or purposefully prevent yourself from falling asleep as a means of taking control of something in your life. And that's something I've seen afflicting a lot of my friends, bedtimes getting later and later and later and later, or, or wake up times getting earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier as a means of just trying to take control. And that has a severe effect on our, um, on our education and how we behave during the day. And it's a, it's a vicious cycle that I've seen in both myself and, and my peers that has a much broader impact than meets the eye. I've done a lot of research into the effects that sleep deprivation have on people. And some of the stuff I've found is absolutely mind boggling. Uh, I know that depriving yourself of sleep for 24 hours is the same as being legally too drunk to drive. And your motor coordination will be impaired, your thought coordination will be impaired, your judgment will be impaired. Everything will affect how you're functioning in day-to-day -day life. And it will almost certainly have an effect on school and how you're learning. So guys, what I would like to do is first of all, A, thank you. B, we've covered a lot of territory and I know that we've thrown a lot at the audience, but one of the things that we wanted to ensure, we wanted to ensure three things. One, you, that you knew what ASAP was in terms of an education group and a support that's youth led. Two, that they, the students have been very, very busy trying to support other students but three, to make sure that the adults that are listening to this were aware of some of the significant factors that are challenging young people today. And it's not just COVID, it's not just isolation, but there's a myriad of things that they're challenging. And, and for me, when I walk through the schools, considering all of this, it is absolutely amazing some of the work that these guys do, but even the quote unquote ASAP kids or the kids who are your leaders, it's hard to be going through this and not be impacted. So I know that we've thrown a lot out to you, but we wanna make sure that if there are people in the audience that have questions, that uh, you feel free to ask questions. You guys have been amazing this evening, very articulate, explaining exactly how this is impacting you. So thank you all very, very much. I personally, I, I really appreciate that. And um, like I was mentioning before, how we're hoping that uh, as the culture shifts um, towards taking care of one another, we hope that uh, the adults and the, the especially the school uh, faculty who are watching this or who might be listening and I think that we're doing a great job up here are inspired to 
do some of the some of their own community based changes, uh, the way that we're trying to do in our own communities. So, so just, just, Miguel brings up an, another well. outstanding point because even though that we're doing this here in East Greenwich, ASAP is not ASAP is more of an amorphous shell and conceptual. And so if people, what we actually do looking to do is to create a peer driven program that addresses mental health, destigmatizes the issue and creates a little bit of a support. And so it's not rocket science. What is rocket science is the willingness of the young people to be honest, the willingness of the young people to challenge the parameters and then to also find ways to be a conduit to your other people in the community. And on top of that, you know, like Miguel was talking about, and you're hearing a multiplicity of, of factors. We're living probably, I keep on, you know, we joke about it all the time. Like I grew up in an era that had, you know, racial strife, Vietnam War, and a lot of stuff going on. And we and people of my era talk a little bit about hiding under the desk during the fallout shelter type thing. Yes, I'm old. But when you stop and think about the world, the young people are faced with today, images that they're seeing on te television perpetually about school shootings, the pace of life being plugged in. You know, it's funny, I was joking with Kathy a little while back just prior to COVID coming out, we were going around doing workshops on screenagers, mm -hmm. speaking about the impact of so much screen time on young people. And now due to the craziness of the world, we're now asking kids to stare at screens all day. So um, there's a lot going on and probably even more going on for kids today than even went on during the 60s. But just uh, Kara's curious about the safe space at the schools and how that's being utilized. I suppose I'll answer that one because I've taken the lead on that project. Um, we're currently still working on securing the space and developing it because COVID has certainly slowed down the process. But we've looked into a lot of other safe spaces that other schools have implemented and they've had profound impacts on the productivity of students. And so we were looking to try to find a way to bring some of that into our own school. So we were hoping to find a secluded room somewhere away from the guidance area and away from the nurse's office because those areas are normally where people go, but they're also very crowded, especially around lunch times and students maybe don't feel always comfortable going there. So we were hoping to find a room that was a little bit secluded and quiet. So we would develop it and um, supply furniture and music, essentially create an atmosphere that would allow people to feel that calm and to take that breath in the middle of an overwhelming day. Thank you, Sophie. Um, a question from Andy Nada, the town manager. Um, are you finding that more substantive or comforting support comes from your friend network, your peers, or from other school community family resources? I want to take I I, I can take that one, um, if you don't mind. Uh, I find that um, for four teens on average, the most comforting support is, is coming from our friend groups because they know us the best. We have closer relationships with them. Um, however, I would very much like to see uh, greater support coming from um, the school and community network. And that is not to say that there isn't support coming from the school and community network. It's more to say that it's not reaching students and that students don't feel that they can engage in it because there is a definite divide between um, students and ad administrative authorities, such as the, the the um, school or the town and their friends. There's mu a much more interpersonal relationship with your friends. So you're, you're more comfortable in that environment. That's actually one of the reasons we wanna create a safe space is to cultivate a more supportive environment at the high school so that students do feel more comfortable and can get more out of um, supportive networks coming from administrative authorities. Um, 
with Ella said about the school, when people come to ASAP for support too, if we do want to recommend them to somebody, we do usually just recommend them straight to Mr. Bob because he is an amazing resource that ASAP has. Um, and, and then Sophie did mention earlier of our ASAP hotline, which um, Sophie, if you could link that like in the chat, that would be awesome, which does refer students to other resources to reach out about mental health. So if students do come to us, those are like other supports we give um, just outside of school or, or Mr. Bob is a great school resource as well. Excellent, thank you. What would you give as the best advice to students who may feel they have these issues? Mind if I uh, say something about that? Sure. Um, something that Ella mentioned was that a lot of the best support is coming from, uh, you know, peer networks and and, and close knit circles. It's that's why it's it's a little bit difficult to give uh, like ubiquitous advice um, for students when it comes to these issues, but. The, the general advice is just kind of the general ASAP uh, philosophy, which is you you have to make that sort of social support network because it's not going to come to you. It's it's not uh, should uh, reach out to other people who are you are close to and who you trust and who are experiencing some other things. And you know, it, so long as you're as you're sharing these problems in a constructive way and and talking about your personal experiences, then it's a really healthy way to sort of get some of that difficulty up. Um, just to jump in again, I kind of want to rep uh, ASAP Team of Teens quickly, which is a club that is like ASAP sponsored. If like a student uh, who is struggling with these issues, I know Sophie mentioned earlier, we are trying to start support groups, but until those uh, start popping up, Team of Teens is a club that connects underclassmen with upperclassmen, but that's not only what it does. We do have some juniors and seniors who are paired together, uh, two juniors that are paired together, things like that. So essentially, in, uh, it's more focusing on just having students and giving them a friend. I mean, I, I run the club with my co-president, Sydney King, uh, and so far it's been an overwhelming success. It's been really great. A lot of different students we, me and Sunny actually interviewed a pair of students who had just met through Team of Teens. And a lot of students have just been saying, it's been really nice over COVID just to have somebody to talk to. And I know that specific pair, and I can also say me and the freshman I'm paired with, we have talked about mental health a lot uh, because ASAP is about mental health and Team of Teens. A lot of people joined it to talk to other people about mental health as well, and just to gain a new friend that they can talk to. And we're still actually accepting people to join that club. So if anybody has any kids that would like to join, um, that's really a great resource that ASAP does offer. Uh, that is is really great. Uh, additionally to uh, what Miguel said and Ella said, they said that uh, you can get a lot of support from friend groups, uh, which is one thing, but it's hard to meet a lot of new friends online. But one thing the school still is doing is clubs are still running, online meetings and things like that. And a lot of clubs are still accepting people. So besides Team of Teens, we do have some other clubs at the school that are, I, I joined a bunch of new clubs this year and they are really fun just to hang out with people. I know one club that just started, it was like Minecraft club where you go online and you play with like a bunch of different people from the school and things like that are a great way to make new friends as well. Would you guys be willing if another school wanted to start a chapter or an equivalent of an ASAP group, be able to mentor them or, and, and if so, how, who, who should they get in touch with to do that? Oh, absolutely. That would be phenomenal. Please, if, if, this, if this video, if this, um, panel falls into the hands of some student at another high school or middle school, uh, even outside Rhode Island, uh, please contact us. You can DM us on Instagram. Um, I put the Instagram into the chat. I'm not sure if you can see it on the recording, so I'll just uh, say it out loud. It's at ASAP Rhode Island. You can contact us through there, and we would absolutely love to see some other chapters popping up in other towns, and um, I think ASAP is really unique in the fact that um, hopefully someday soon when another chapter does pop up, one of our big things is that ASAP is, as Bob said, constantly evolving. And it's not a set concrete system. It's designed so that it can be placed into the hands of others and that they can mold it so that it fits their community and their needs and the way that their community operates. We've molded ASAP so that it fits EG. But the blueprint that we can that we created can be molded to fit any community, to fit any group of people. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about it. So if anybody 
comes across this video and is interested in starting their own ASAP chapter, or if anybody listening has any kids who are interested in getting involved, please contact us. Michaela also just put our email into the chat. Again, I'm not sure if you can see it, so I'll read it out loud. It, um, it is asapoutreach at gmail.com. So please, please contact us. Or Mr. Hodling. Or Mr. Hodling. He, yeah, he's a really good resource for this kind of thing. So again, if there's any final questions, please throw them in the chat box. But I really want to just thank um, all of you for um, your honesty, your courage, and all of the work that you're doing at the high school. Um, it's it's amazing, really. Um, and thank you, Bob. Um, I just want to thank to remind people who are on the call. This is a um, support. This presentation has been supported as part of a mental health grant. Um, it will be recorded and archived for others to see. So there is a survey at the end. If if you wouldn't mind taking that, that's part of the evaluation for the grant. No, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time um, to be with us tonight. And as I stated previously, it is an honor to work with young people who really care about their communities who are really incredibly reflective considering some of the challenges in their own lives. And I've learned so much from them. And one of the things I'm really looking forward to, and these guys are always recruiting younger students to, you know, they're going down to the middle schools, looking to perpetuate this as a club and even have it go from here. And then again, I think it would be really neat if other districts or other communities wanted to do programs like this because behind the scenes too there's also some science and philosophy behind it but that's something that this is not the forum for but we'd be honored to you know it's one thing you know when you're in a group and you're talking to yourself all day and supporting yourself all day but it would be really fun to be able to expand and speak to other students and other professionals from other communities so Thank you very much just for giving us this opportunity. I, I know for myself, I can just say, if I ever feel despondent or frustrated with you know, current events, I look around at the young people here and I, I feel so hopeful about the future. Their, their ability to talk so openly about mental health and, and other related topics is, gives me so much help for change, hope for change. So thank you guys.